St. Lambert Church in Skokie was dedicated on June 4th, 1961. And that's important because St. Lambert Church was designed and built before the beginning of the Second Vatican Council. What we have in the church is something really very wonderful. It is a modern church with a very traditional plan, a basilica plan, where you have a nave and a sanctuary and tabernacle behind the altar. And we also have another interesting feature, which is the baptismal font at the very entrance of the church because the baptistry formerly was a very small room and we do a lot of ceremonies for the whole congregation or for large groups of people. And so here we are at the threshold of what we could call eternal life. Baptism opens the threshold to the church itself, the community of the faithful. And the baptismal font is the original. It's done with a, a, a reddish marble, which is called French Rouge Antique. And the bottom, the base, is a crema perla marble, and it matches the altar. And that's significant, too, because baptism and the Eucharist are sacraments that we consider to be the most important. The one is the introduction. The other is the constant renewal of the presence of Christ. The baptismal font is right uh, in front of the paschal candle. And as we enter the church, we are struck by the most important thing that we see is the back wall, the crucifix, and the altar. In traditional churches, we look at the high places as being a kind of a sign of something truly sacred that is going to happen. And what happens is a celebration of the Eucharist, the Mass, and that's one of the reasons why the focus is the way it is, because we consider the Mass the unbloody sacrifice of Calvary, constantly renewed, never repeated. And so when we have the steps leading up to the altar, we have, in a certain sense, Calvary in our presence. So that every time we experience the Eucharist, we experience Christ's death and resurrection. Our celebration of the Eucharist recalls the Last Supper. We look at the sanctuary and we see a back wall, which is made up of 85 concrete blocks that have diamond-shaped windows. And in those windows, there's a kind of a mosaic glass. And the intent of the architect and the artists involved was that it should create a, a luminous halo around the cross, that when you look at the altar, the cross, the crucifix, is surrounded by a kind of a halo of light. We see the various colors involved in those windows. And if you notice, as you go higher, there are brighter colors. Uh, the cross is 18 feet, and it's suspended from a baldachin, which is above the altar. The crucifix itself, as well as the statues of the Sacred Heart and St. Joseph the Worker, are carved in linden wood, and they are from an artist named Ermano Warderer, uh, in Bolzano, Italy, which is in far northern Italy. And if the work looks somewhat Germanic, it's because that particular town in Italy has populations that speak both German and Italian. It's significant, it's very beautiful, as the Stations of the Cross are also by the same studio, and they are also done in Lindenwood. As we walk in the church, we cannot help but notice the very beautiful stained glass windows that are contemporary windows by Gabriel Loire. And on the right side, as you enter the church, there's a series of windows that at first you may wonder, what is actually being depicted here? We see the nativity and we know what that is. 
We see Jesus presiding over the wedding of a husband and wife. We see a picture of Jesus over a priest, a religious sister, and children who are in uniform. And we see then a picture of Jesus blessing what appears to be St. Lambert Parish, the building at the, uh, at the bottom right. And this is intentional by the artist. And then of course, the final picture is of the last judgment. You say, how does that all fit together? I say that it's, it's life cycles in Christ. Christ is in every single one of the, pic, the pictorial windows. The windows are, are unique and very beautiful. Gavlier Loire was an artist of incomparable quality. He used slab stained glass, which is thicker than the kind of glass that was used in the medieval cathedrals. It had the advantage too, is if you chip it off, you get a different kind of light coming through. And there's a kind of a very thin layer of cement, like 1 18th of an inch that holds these beautiful windows together. Gabriel Loire really loved blue. And one of the reasons why is he always thought of it as being the great symbol of peace. He even had a, a saying, la paix donne la joie, which means peace gives us joy. And it's a beautiful idea. And of course, his windows are very beautiful. On this side of the church, we have windows that sometimes you say, how does this fit together? Uh, one window you can't see very well is off to the far end in the, in the choir loft, and it is of the Good Samaritan. And the second window is a picture of what appears to be a priest giving communion to children. Uh, the one beyond that is uh, a young man kneeling in front of an old man, and I discern that to be the prodigal son returning home. Then there is an image of Saint Maria Goretti, the young woman who was martyred for the sake of purity. Then there is the patron saint of the parish, Saint Lambert. There's a lance in front of him because he was assassinated and a, a martyr. And finally, a very beautiful window of the Blessed Virgin Mary with her mantle extended and people gathering underneath her for her protection. Now, as I see it, the series really gives us a view of the sacraments and also the saints. So we have, first of all, the Good Samaritan. And of course, that's the primal idea of love your neighbor as yourself. And that is what really introduces the whole story of the Good Samaritan is who is my neighbor? And so it's a good beginning. And also we should see right underneath it, that window is in honor of, the communion window is in honor of Pius X, who allowed young children to receive communion as young as the age of seven, age of reason. And so he's often seen in that position of distributing communion to very young children. The prodigal son, of course, is a sign of reconciliation and is right above our confessionals. And beyond that, Maria Goretti is a patron saint not only of chastity, but also of youth. And so there is a, a great sense in which youth is very much encouraged in a parish that had at the time a school. Uh, St. Lambert, of course, that doesn't take too much explanation. He's the patron. And Our Lady, who is extending her cloak over people, sign of great protection and love, tenderness. Now, if we can look at the back of the church, or actually the front of it, we have perhaps the most beautiful of all the windows in the church. Right above the choir loft, there is a very beautiful stained glass window of the whole Paschal mystery. And actually, you don't see it all together unless you go into the vestibule again because the bottom part represents Holy Thursday. So you've got the Last Supper. You even have in the Last Supper Judas holding the bag of money. You've got the agony in the garden. And then you go up a little bit farther and you will see 
of course, Jesus on the cross is central to the whole thing. But beyond that, there's also, you know, the two Marys and also St. John under the cross, the sun and the moon together near the cross. And then, of course, symbols of the resurrection. We have the three women going to the tomb, the angel, and then finally, toward the end of it all, we have the feet of the Lord and Savior ascending into heaven. So we have the whole summary of the Paschal mystery. It's very beautifully done. And Father Simon did some, a great favor for the neighborhood. He has the, the window backlit so at night. You can see it from the street. And now we're up close to the altar, which is solid block of perla crema marble. And perhaps the most noticeable thing is the unusual symbol on the front of the altar, which is the key row, quite stylized, and also a line that goes all the way across it. You could say, well, what does that mean? It means, I think, a number of things. One of the things is that it shows that the symbol of Christ is one that reaches out to the far reaches. Or else, as my art teacher once said, she said, if you look at it closely, it looks a bit like a ship in a kind of dynamic movement forward, a sail, and so on. And I, I think whichever way you want to look at it, it's a challenge, a challenge to your imagination. But no doubt about it, the altar is a symbol of Christ. And as all traditional altars, it has relics of three saints, St. Lambert and St. Candidus and St. Constance. Uh, the last two were um, early martyrs of the church. So we have this continuity with the ancient tradition of celebrating near the tombs of the martyrs. And of course, the altar, which is kissed by the celebrant at mass, is a symbol of Christ himself. In my time as pastor, the second pastor of St. Lambert Parish, Father James Murtaugh, died. And he was a very generous man, and he was a good pastor. And he, he left the parish a certain amount of money, and we decided to use some as a memorial, and decided to do a bas-relief of St. Lambert. And it's modeled on the exterior plaque that's on the outside of the church. Uh, it's almost exactly the same, but it's carved in wood. The image of St. Lambert uh, shows him blessing, and it's based on that, that image which was done by, believe it or not, Willi Klopfenstein of Milwaukee. And I think it's a fitting memorial to a pastor who dedicated his life to the parish. And the statue was installed in 1998 after Father Murtaugh's death. This is the Marian Shrine of St. Lambert Church. And a very recent uh, acquisition under Father Simon was this very beautiful triptych of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, done by Father Anthony Branken. Uh, a priest and artist of the archdiocese. Father Branken said that it, it's an unusual painting in the sense that it is not an authentic icon in the Eastern sense, but it is one that is inspired by the tradition of the Byzantine church. Uh, Our Lady Perpetual Help is seen here as a young woman, and she is somewhat Western looking. Notice the two angels. They're holding the instruments of the passion. Jesus, very naturalistically, look at, look at the eyes, looks at them and is so frightened that he's losing his shoe. Because, and what's she doing? She's holding on to him with great tenderness. It's beautiful. And of course, that's in the original. See, the original is over there. If you look at the traditional icon, you'll see a whole different image of the Blessed Virgin, her face 
and is not quite so naturalistically portrayed. But icons are meant in the Eastern Church to represent not what we see in nature so much as what we see beyond that through faith. If there is one mystery of our faith that ties us together with all art, it's that of the incarnation. But in the Eastern Church, it's not only the incarnation that is inspiring the painting, but also the transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor, where the apostles saw him in a heavenly light. They saw him beyond what the eyes of their earthly perception could perceive. I think that Father Branken expresses it very well in some of his own notes, and if I may, I will read what he had to say, because I asked him, I said, is there anything you would like me to say? And this is what he says. My version of Our Lady of Perpetual Help is a Latin artist's interpretation of a Byzantine icon. There is the hint, the suggestion, an homage, so to speak, to the supernaturality of the Byzantine icon, but also a certain nod toward the beauty seen in nature, a nature used to reveal the supernatural. Whether or not that synthesis is achieved is answered if and only if the beholder looks at a particular painting and is moved to prayer. And I do think that Father Branken was very successful in engaging the prayerful person.